Good evening, everybody. My name is Tasmia Chaudhry, and I am a proud representative of the club MSA, also known as Muslim Student Association, and I am the club's president. Hello, everybody. My name is Kashmala Swati, and I am the vice president of MSA. And for those of you guys who are curious, MSA is a newly restarting club, which is open to Muslims and non-Muslims and people of diverse backgrounds. This organization has a set goal to educate the students and facility of the college about Muslims and what they are, as well as building unity through diversity. With the help of our advisor, who is also a well-known U.S. Gov professor, Mirsad Kurish Stars, MSA was able to sponsor this event, Lesson of the Holocaust, with a very special guest, Mr. Peter Konstam. Mr. Konstam is a Holocaust survivor, Arthur, and a global ambassador of the Anne Frank Center. Konstam will be talking about in details of how in 1938, Germans and other Europeans led by the Nazis began and executed Holocaust against the European Jewish population. With that being said, Dr. Mirsad Kreshyastas and Mr. Kronstam will be leading this event as well as moderating the discussion afterwards. And to now get this discussion started with Dr. Mirsad would like to say a few words. Well, thank you, Tashmia. Thank you very much. Um, this is a very nice initiative. Uh, we spoke about it in our club meeting, and we decided to actually do something special because event like this, or, or how we say memory to something like this, it uh, re requires us to essentially do something special. And we reached out to Mr. Konstam, and he was kind enough to join us which is excellent. And some students just couldn't believe it. I have to admit to you right away, Mr. Konstam, that they were so happy about the fact that somebody who knew Anna Frank will join us for this conversation, because for some of them, that book that they read was a very, very important book. So I can say, to begin with, it's great to be with you all again. You know, thank you to you, MSA, for initiating this conversation. And Thank to Social Science Club and Social and Behavioral Sciences and Human Services for supporting the event. If you are interested in any of these clubs, you can reach them directly through their Insta Instagram social media accounts. And so today is November 10th, and we wanted to essentially on this day do this program. Why? Because on November 9th and 10th in 1938, Nazi leaders in Europe unleashed a series of pogroms against the Jewish populations in the territories under their control. This event came to be known as Kristallnacht or the Night of Broken Glass. The Kristallnacht became, became a turning point in the history of the Third Reich as the event that signaled the shift from anti-Semitic rhetoric and legislation to the violent action and aggressive anti-Jewish measures that would culminate with the Holocaust of 6 million uh, and probably even more people. As we did before, we at Broward College want to remember innocent victims of these events and learn from that. Um, in this instance, we want to learn what happened when one of the most advanced European societies was enabled by its government to slide into the darkness of ethnic and religious intolerance, intolerance and hate of its own people, of its own Jewish population. So with us to help us remember and learn about Holocaust is Mr. Peter Konstam, a global ambassador of, um, of Anna Frank Center in the United States. Mr. Konstam was born in Amsterdam in 1936. His parents, Hans and Ruth Konstam, were forced to flee uh, Germany to Amsterdam in Netherlands during the early days of the Nazi regime. It was by chance that the Konstanz apartment in Amsterdam was just downstairs from the family of Anne Frank. Her root, Konstam, Mr. Konstam's mom, became a close friend of Edith Frank and Anne, the youngest daughter, and uh, Anne became Peter's babysitter. Both children attended 
uh, the local schools in the neighborhood. When Nazi persecution of Jews in the Netherlands became intolerable, the Franks went into hiding while Peter's parents decided to flee Amsterdam. And after a year long trek through Belgium, France, and Spain, they reached safety and freedom in Argentina, South America. In 1963, uh, Mr. Konstam immigrated to the United States where he pursued a career in chemical industry focusing on pharmaceutical and cosmetics. He became a United States citizen in 1968. He and his wife, Susan, married in 1965 and have two children and three grandchildren. Now, Mr. Konstam uh, is retired and he lives in Venice, Florida, while he's still active in the community affairs and education of people about the Holocaust. Mr. Konstam is also an author and his book, A Chance to Live, was published um, in the Netherlands in February 2008 and Germany 2016. If you're interested, you can get his book on Amazon and I just posted a link in the chat for you to essentially uh, look and probably if you wanna get it. And so tonight we're going to first hear a presentation about his journey, his interaction with Anna Frank and events that preceded the Holocaust in Europe in 1930s. And then we can open the microphone and have a conversation about everything with questions and comments from you in the audience. And so Mr. Konstam, thank you again for your kindness and willingness to join us and help us better uh, understand this horrible experience of Holocaust. And now microphone is yours, please take over. And we're gonna turn off the camera so that uh, you know we don't distract people and you can essentially be the only one with a camera on. Um, well, uh, first of all, i like to thank you, uh, Dr. Mizra, for having uh, given me the honor of addressing your class at Broward College tonight. And as you indicated, it's very timely because the celebrations of Kristallnacht since last week and ensuing this week are continuing. I'm deeply uh, uh, humbled that you and, 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 and your class has invited me uh, to speak to you all. And so thank you very much also to the Yael naturally that introduced us together. And I want to thank everybody that helped you to organize this presentation. I understand Tashmia there, and um, one of the other ladies that was there a few minutes ago, uh, Kashmala. I also want to thank, uh, I guess he is a professor, uh, Professor Bernhardt of the social studies of uh, um, uh, section of uh, Broward College for being in attendance. And actually a good friend, fairly new, uh, Mr. Jeff Stahl, who is the executive director of the American Society of Yad Vashem, Southeastern region, in, which is a new office uh, out of Boca Raton. So, this country is at war. I'm paraphrasing the BBC announcement on September the 3rd, 1939. That was Edward Morrow, who out of London made a statement announcing that the BBC would ensuingly, mostly in secret, continue to broadcast all through the war years for all of us who listened to the BBC surreptitiously during the war. This country is at war, and the story is of my parents and mine, a chance to live. As Dr. Misrat said, that's the prize winning a book in English. And the next two pictures on the right are 
in the Netherlands and in Germany, the cover of the German book on the bottom right is a painting of my father. And we have the road to Argentina, which started for my parents in Germany in 1933, ensuingly to Holland and from Holland in 1942, eventually landing in Argentina, which had not been planned and was a one year, 13 month trip of uh, mostly walking through Europe. Next. That is my father Hans, who was an artist with two of his paintings. He had studied in the famous Bauhaus, Bauhaus and Dessau near Dresden. Next. In 1932, um, my parents got married. Uh, my ancestry and the family came from Bavaria, specifically Nuremberg, and a small town today, which is a neighborhood really, Fürth. And you see the picture of the photograph. On the bottom left, you see the synagogue where they got married, which as you can see was quite substantial building. I will just say this, that during Kristallnacht, November, 9, 10, 1938, 11,000, um, no, 1,000, excuse me, synagogues were destroyed. 1938, you see the picture on the top right, what has been left from one of them, and on the bottom is a photograph that Susan and I took of a, of, of a stone to remember and remind people where a synagogue had stood earlier. Next. These photographs show you um, on the top left uh, in the rally grounds in Nuremberg, which can still be visited as we speak. And I have to say for a minute that those who are denying the existence of the Holocaust and the existence plus everything else, all what I have to do, go and visit the rally grounds in Nuremberg. And there you can see five, four or 500,000 people gather. Next is a, oh. oh I'm sorry. Uh, next is a photograph uh, of Hitler already being uh, on the picture, being uh, uh, elected as chancellor with the standards and the swastikas. And if you look carefully in the top of the standards, you see the circles and on top of that, the eagles. And what he had in mind was by infusing fear is to remind people that he was thinking of the, of the Roman uh, legions in coming into, uh, uh, the, uh, to occupy the lands that he had planned. Uh, the bottom picture is obvious, so next. Um, starting shortly after 1933-34, my parents had to flee within seconds, no, not seconds, within minutes, somebody had seen a painting of my father uh, who lived at that time with his young wife in the ground floor apartment in, in, in uh, Fürth, or Nuremberg. And they saw the uh, painting of his, and somebody passed, accused that to the police, uh, my father was accused of painting degenerate uh, artwork, which then, as some of you may have read, many artists and painters and composers and everybody involved in creating and developing were accused of degenerate art. What you see are the, the um, um, uh, one poster that I think is very, meaningful on the, on the bottom left. It's, a, I think, a woman, if one looks close, close to it, an angel. In German translated, it says the guiding, uh, the guardian angel, with a depicting of the meaning of a Jewish, supposedly, uh, banker or businessman holding a bag of money. 
I think that's a terribly insulting picture because there have many, there have been many people in other religions who have done things that are never been uh, accused. And number two, the people don't know what Jewish people have done, which this year, Germany is remembering 1700 years, 1700 years of Jewish life in Germany. And I, I call part of it in my presentations, the Jewish culture. Next. Uh, from, um, my, my, as my parents had to, to flee Germany within the hours in 1933, they moved to Amsterdam in the Netherlands because the Netherlands was still a neutral country. And even though persecutions and, and other kind of things already had started, the war hadn't occurred yet. And eventually they moved to the street Marveda Plain. Um, it's clear we lived where we lived and where the Otto Frank family lived. Uh, the, the scooter is to remind me that uh, my parents' ancestry, my paternal uh, family ancestry had been in the toy business. They were quite a well-known uh, toy company. Um, and so during the early years, during peace, I was a rather popular kid because I always had toys for everybody. So one day I find a, 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 a scooter in the living room. Uh, that is not a scooter, nor the color. Well, the scooter had, uh, had wheels that were as big as bicycle wheels. And Anna came running around. She got wind of this, took me across the street. Uh, the ground uh, covered with gravel. And bad maneuver, we fell on the ground. Now, this is about 1930, I guess, 1938, 39. It was already very difficult for Jewish people to go to hospitals and doctors and nurses. They were all in the war front. But one doctor in the neighborhood sewed up my chin. And the result is a... a um, um, Souvenir. Well, yeah, no, the, uh, the scar, which is a souvenir, what I call a souvenir of Anna Frank. Next. This is what you see, um, uh, a picture during happy times, uh, even though it's taken around 1940, possibly before the occupation of Belgium, the Netherlands, and France. And you see the Frank family um, on the far left, you see Otto, then Anne, then uh, uh, I think that's Margot, wasn't it? Yeah. And Margot in the back and then Ease is the mother. On the bottom is my father and then my mother, my grandmother and me. What is interesting in these pictures that you see what the dress codes were, even on the bad times or weekends, etc. Naturally, jeans and t-shirts didn't exist. So people wore well and dressed well, even at weekends when they were taking strolls. Next. That is what it is. And Anne is looking down on the uh, picture on the far right uh, to possibly what was our garden. Uh, apartments on the ground floor, like ours, had small gardens in the backyard. Yes. That is the garden. I will refer to this a little later, especially the alley next. Um, again, uh, uh, at some point uh, during uh, playing bridge with uh, my parents, or at some point, Edith, Anna's mother complained to my mother that Anna was leaving old papers around, etc., and uh, being uh, proper and German race that wasn't the way to handle a proper organized uh, home, uh, even though their apartment was a little bigger than ours. So my mother suggested her birthday was Anna's birthday was coming up. Why don't you buy a diary? And one day on June 13th, 
the father, somebody came and gave Anna the birthday gift of the diary. The pictures on the wall uh, is something to remind us that Anna was a very, very happy young uh, girl, extremely advanced for her age, for her age, copiously writing, as many people know now. But she was acting, making believe she was an actress and this and, and poems and etc. Was interested in fashion, high heels. She was already at an age of puberty, uh, seven years older than I was, and was interested in things of the day, like actors, movies, some philosophers, etc. And she had these pictures. Um, on the wall. What you're seeing here is not exactly all the photographs, but if you go to the, uh, if you virtualize the annex, you will see some other pictures. On the bottom, naturally, is a handwriting uh, and a diary with a picture of hers when she was a younger girl. Thanks. This is a composite of, what number is that? Um, that shows a few things. So we have a quilt that Susan made, which is now moving and showing you there, I'm showing you. She quilted this a few weeks ago. She made a few others. Yeah, you want to talk about it a minute and tell them what you did? Uh, on the quilt are the various stars of David. Uh for the different countries that people were forced to wear during this time. Uh, the Dutch one was one that Peter and his family wore, as well as uh, Anna Frank. And as you could see in Poland, they wore that one. Germany, they had to wear that one. This one was an armband in U Yugoslavia. Another one in France, Romania, is the Holland, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Belgium, parts of Poland, parts of Slovakia. Um, so those are the, the uh, stars that, the, of David that were, people were forced to wear during that time. I'm going to show you something. It's about the second or third time I, I'm showing this in a presentation because my wife generally doesn't let me show this, I keep it under a bed, and this is what it is. Hold on, there, hold it there. Oh, yeah. And you see a piece of bread on the top. These are original stars of David. I didn't wear those, but other people, brothers or sisters did. And I was able to get that many years ago from Amsterdam. The piece of bread is to remind me that for the longest time, we didn't have to eat or bread, especially during our flight, which was 85 or so percent of a walk all the way from Belgium, the border of Belgium with the Netherlands to Spain with many, many fraud. Um, um, uh, 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 adventures and terrible things. Mirsad asked me if I can expand on how Jewish neighbors acted after the prosecution of Jews started. Um, well, I have a short answer. Terrorized and in fear. We started to be persecuted, as I said early in the presentation, in, in Germany, my parents and many others, in 1933. And that ensued until, naturally, it came worse and worse, 1940, during the occupation of the various countries in Europe. What the Star of David did, which you see on the slide, and as Susan said, they were handmade out of fabric, generally in a yellowish golden uh, uh, shade. 
stitched in the middle the name of Jew in the uh, in the country's uh, idiom. In this case, Yod, meaning this was in the Netherlands. What that did, it separated society for the first time in hundreds of years, if not even ever before, even though in Germany, Jews had been persecuted before, but they were always reaccepted, even by some bishops and so on, as the history of Germany ensued. The Netherlands was always a country of people who were friendly, neighborly, helping. And I would be stopped on the streets and the public transportation, which I did often because my mother would take me. It was a good babysitter when I was a little pain. And they would give me candies and this and that and talk and how cute and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. That separated society for the first time. That meant that now, with the other things that the Nazis were doing, with the Gestapo and the SS, is infuse fear. And in addition, we were naturally then terrorized because the laws then were that if you didn't, that you had to have the Star of David stitched on the outside lapel of your uh, uh, coat or jacket, whichever you were wearing. You were not allowed to be shopping or buying if you didn't have that. Many shop uh, people and stores stopped selling p uh, things to the Jews, insulting, demeaning many, especially on the streets and the German controls, which you see uh, marching in into different countries, including the Netherlands. That went far into, on the bottom right, you see a mechanized uh, equipment. And what the Germans started to do was raiding homes and apartments and announced a mechanized equipment of three vehicles, a truck uh, uh, preceded by a, a, a sidecar motorcycle with a minor office, and then the car in the back, which you see there, was one of the offices. They would generally ruin, destroy, knock down doors, take things away that belong to the people, which many art and books and other things they would then keep for themselves. Our immediate neighbor was raided at some point. And uh, actually, when we heard the sirens, we were all even more afraid than afraid because by then, we are now talking 1942, there was really already a way in, in, in local persecutions, the meanings, beatings, killings, putting kids and uh, in, uh, um, uh, adults against the wall to betray others in their family or neighborhoods who would generally not do it and be machine gunned down in front of my eyes. And our neighbors, immediate neighbors between us and the Franks got raided one day. A very good friend of my grandmother, they played bridge together during curfew hours. And all, there were eight, all seven were machine gunned down. One day it was our turn. And my grandmother fell because the first husband had been a German officer in the First World War. They wouldn't do anything to us. They didn't really destroy anything and whatever, but they sort of 
wanted me to betray the family and a lot of things. This was the first incident that we had where I was confronted with a direct contact like this before. Nobody got trained, nobody was educated in this. We didn't know how anybody would act or not. So here we were standing in our living room, my grandmother and I in front of my parents, and I wasn't talking in spite of the fact that uh, uh, my family and others know I talk a little bit, uh, etc. but I was mom. Eventually I felt a piece of paper being slipped into my hand and just by gut feeling, I didn't move, and eventually, had some, not to create attention, eventually, I made believe I was coughing. And then a, a few seconds later, I put it in my mouth, again, not to attract attention, and I swallowed it. The soldiers got uh, disappointed, a little fed up, left. And afterwards, I asked my grandmother, I said, you know, I swallowed this paper. What happens next? She put her arm around my shoulder and said, Peter Lee, which is a diminutive in German and Yiddish, don't worry, it will come out. Yes, it did come out at some point. The, the note had the names of people that were going to help us, and I will go into that in a little bit if they would have seen the Germans, the names, they would have been immediately apprehended and sent to the camps. Now, it says here by Dr. Mirzat, can you note any specific example of people in action and silent approval of prosecution? Sure. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there, was a, there were a lot of people in action either because of fear or because others were involved with the Nazi, Nazi youth or whatever. And so there was an action. The great Eli Wiesel, Eli Wiesel once said, the reason for, for many of the problems in the war was indifference. And if there's any youth there listening to me now in this meeting, please don't be indifferent. Read history, know what, what is on, be sure you talk the truth and stand up. Fight ignorance with knowledge and respect and dignity. Next. This is a, a list that somebody wrote, I think, uh, in, the, um, in one of the archives or whatever. It shows the street Mavero plane on the top right in red, and then uh, 17, us, the Constance, a few lines under that are the Franks. And Susan will tell you about the other picture. The other picture is a map of uh, Am Amsterdam. And we visited a museum in Amsterdam and they told us that uh, they made such an accurate map of where all the Jews were living in Amsterdam that it was easy enough for the Germans to go in and, uh, and find them. They said they didn't have to be so accurate. Uh, it was their big mistake. And this, and this picture uh, it is a picture of children that were uh, put out of the regular school and had to go attend a school only for Jewish children. Peter says he recognizes the teacher in the center and the principal over towards the left. However, we were told that the picture was taken after the Konstams had fled. So our guess is yeah. that all these children, most of these children never survived the Holocaust. Uh, they weren't as lucky as Peter. We, the time came where people on our street and others were sent orders 
to present ourselves to a railroad station, in this case, in Amsterdam, with the belongings that you are seeing that Susan translated, the call-up notice, two shirts, a work suit, a mug, a, a pullover, a towel, toilet articles, food for three days, which is what a train would take to take us to uh, Westerborg. We were told much later that 1,500 people had been ordered to go to the station and 750 fled among them, the Franks and us, and the rest were sent to camps. Um, the interesting thing of this is, and you cannot see it, is that the letter was sent by the a department in the Netherlands of emigration, which apparently the Germans used very cleverly to front for them not to be uh, giving people a, another chance of accusing them of being the bad guys. And obviously the, 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 the Jewish Dutch organization went with it, I don't think, I don't know if they could have done anything else. From Westerbork, which is still a, uh, was a way station gathering prison, it's still a prison today. Weekly transports of 650 to 700 people will be sent either to Auschwitz in Poland or to Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia. And I will show you how this, these transports took, uh, how that happened. Um, there you see on the top left, Gerda Leske, which was one of the families mentioned on the little paper swallowed. And on the bottom is the railroad station. Actually, the railroad station with a tram. Uh, I, I, many years ago, our first trip to Amsterdam, 15 years or something ago, I remember the white and blue, and they're still white and blue. Only the, the railroad station didn't look as nice as it is in that picture. I will talk more in a little bit. Oh, um, so the Leskes. The Leskes were a Christian German family that my mother was very, very friendly with. Uh, they became friends for many years. My mother would visit Goethe. Uh, every year and a half or so. Um, they had two dress stores. So when the instructions were received to go to the railroad station, a meeting, a quick meeting was held in our apartment. Now again, nobody had big meetings or preparations or plans or Etc. You couldn't go to a bank because we had to wear the Star of David. You couldn't take your belongings if you had them because many had been taken away by these raids that I was telling you about. So just think about this. Eventually, uh, the meeting was my mother, my father, my grandmother, and a doctor in the neighborhood. And it was a very tight, emotional, crying combination of feelings and goodbyes and what would happen and not wanting to leave and wanting to leave or needing to leave. My father was not one to leave Germany as many others. We felt they were from Germany and Germans and they had done all these things, so why should we leave? The doctor and my grandmother came up with some thoughts and my grandmother said, we have two possibilities. Either you stay 
and I will then close the lock the apartment and blow it up. And I believe now, many years later, when I was writing my books and so on, that she would have really done it. Or if you left and fled, you had a chance to live. And many years later, when I was uh, writing my book, and eventually I was finished and I needed a title, Susan uh, remembered this story in the apartment in Amsterdam, and thus the title became A Chance to Live. Now I want to also tell you that at one evening, Otto Frank invited my family to join them in the hiding place, which at that time, when it was said, you know, they were in the Frank's apartment playing bridge, was a big secret because nobody knew about us. But obviously my parents decided that uh, that was not a good idea for various reasons. Uh, my mother and my father were already uh, uh, in a discord situation, even though they helped and cooperated during the flight, but they were, uh, they had already enough of each other. And I was a little kid talking and etc. cetera. Anna was also uh, gregarious and talking. Nobody knew how long we would have to be in hiding and how this would all work out being cooped up for an X period of time. So on the top right, you see the yellow map, which starts in Amsterdam and goes down to Maastricht. So when the orders were received to go to the station, my mother immediately called Gerda, who the, the Leskes had two dress stores one in Amsterdam and one in Maastricht, about two and a half, two, two and a half hours south uh, of Amsterdam, as you can see on the bottom of the first map. And she said, come to my shop immediately and we'll plan. Now, in, in the meantime, uh, uh, since the Jewish people and others had to, were forced to wear the Star of David, you had to find some way of making, earning some money. And there wasn't any way of doing it. So a lot of black market ensued and earning money under the table. Uh, my mother was always in, who had been a teacher, uh, a kindergarten teacher of Montessori, but loved cosmetics, um, uh, fashion and designing, and much more. And that really also attracted Anna Frank to my mother. So that is how they both hit it off very well. So off we went. Uh, we, we always crossed the borders separately. Uh, why? Because although there were meeting places established before, uh, a time, etc. It was felt that if one was apprehended, the other one would be possibly be safe and get through to the meeting point. And generally I went with my father, but in this particular case, the first time I went with my mother in public, in the public uh, tram, etc. And Gerda had said, come through the back door, which we did. My father took a bicycle and he went through the back alley that you saw in the garden, which was fraught with um, SS and, 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 and military, but he got through, so they didn't stop him. And so we all joined in, in Goethe's shop. And the first thing we did naturally was to take the Stars of David off our garments. And that created a problem because the Stars of David had, had created a, a, a swatch. So uh, there was no way of dying that over. And 
uh, we had to then change our jackets, which Goethe uh, gave us, or coats. She developed a very dangerous and clever ploy. Now, my mother, as I said, was interested and involved in designing cosmetics and so on. My father, as I've indicated at the beginning, was an artist. So she was going to plan to have a mock fashion show in a store in Maastricht. My mother was the model, my father was the designing artist. And in the ride down to uh, uh, Maastricht, which as I said, was two, two and a half hours and by a train, I was not allowed to recognize my parents. And that was about the second big incidence of how was I going to act, especially not being able to recognize your parents. So my mother and I made it to, to the train. My father was a little late. Gerda's husband was standing there, a tall, blonde, good-looking man. Uh, he approached my father as he saw him coming along and they shook hands and my father felt something being slipped into his hands, which wound up being the tickets for the train. And he um, winked his eyes indicating that wife and child and his wife were okay in the train. Naturally, the big thing came not to recognize my mother. That was one. There was something else I'll tell you in a minute. And that was, I remember looking at my mother and she looked down on the floor and out and I knew exactly what the message was. And I got very emotional at that time, at that moment. It was a loaded uh, train full of workers going to Maastricht. Uh, from Amsterdam, and uh, Gerda hugged me, and I got tranquilized, and things were okay. But then the guards came, and were checking documents. And there was the train guard with Gestapo. Well, we all froze, and my father started um, uh, he was sitting on the back of us, so I couldn't really see him. And my mother was in the front, a few seats away from where Gerda and I were. And now, how was this going to work out? Well, a long story short, the guards saw the document and asked one question that my father answered and stamped it, and everything was fine. So the test of him falsifying documents uh, did very well. And in fact, those falsified documents helped us until Sp almost until Spain. And then the white map is what ensued. And I don't have the time to go into this, but it's all across France. And I would have one more little story or two and Let's go to the next picture. This is France occupied and not and still two Frances before France was occupied. And the, the thought was and goal that if we could re read uh, the somehow the borderline between the red and, and, and purple, specifically the river share, not just reach it, but then cross it, we would possibly be safe. The French flag that you're seeing, for those of you who are involved in history, is what you see, the French flag, but it has the Croix de Lorraine. The Croix de Lorraine became the mark of the free France 
under the goal and of the resistance in free France. Using the French at a very famous speech that the Gaulle gave on June 18th of 1940, rallying the French troops in England and other ways to retake and defend and occupy their own country. So that's what that flag means. Now, my mother um, was part of the French underground. And then, well, I'll have something else to say later, next. Uh, I'll go quick. Uh, we were in the middle of, of uh, in France now. Uh, I went even to school for a while. And, uh, one day, the French, uh, the, the German uh, Nazis, uh, were after me, followed me, I ran away. And we lived in a farmhouse that a very gracious French woman had uh, given us at no charge to live in. But the bathroom, so to speak, otherwise known as outhouse, was 30, 40 yards away. So that was it. No showers, no bath, that's it. So I ran and hid, and I hid in the, in the, um, um, uh, in the toilet. Well, there wasn't a toilet. It, it was the, and the ground was a hole with feces, and that is where I hid myself from toe to head for half an hour, and I disappeared. Um, uh, naturally, my mother came running. She was with some farmers, possibly. Uh, making some new uh, clothes with an old sewing machine of some sort. Uh, there were no fabrics or anything, so they must have used bed sheets or curtains. My father was axing wood for the fireplace, which was also the kitchen stove, a big iron uh, uh, stove, worn by wood. And so the I got out of there and then eventually I got washed off and uh, showered off from water over a well at a pump, which was between that outhouse and the farmhouse next. That is the Cher River. And Susan found this photo one day and it's really very much what I had in thought. So I cannot go into detail. This is another big adventure, uh, how we crossed it at 4.30 in the morning, six people, uh, one an elderly couple, they drowned, another big sad impression. And it was one fear uh, uh, thing after another. So people ask me how, was it very fearful or whatever? Well, it was one after another. We were overly feared already. Next. Uh, the time came when France was occupied now. So uh, the police came to the lady that had lent us the farmhouse and we had to leave again within 20, 25 minutes. And she made uh, arrangements because her husband had been in the Turkish French Railroad Union to get some pack packages, passages, etc. And don't forget, we didn't have luggage, baggage. We didn't have much money, if at all. Um, and so here we were. Um, the train was supposed to follow the blue line into Perpignan, but as Germans had it, they changed course. And you never knew when, where, and how that would happen. And it went from the top there to a place called Gours. But little did we know until a little bit later where that train stopped at Gours. And in the train again, uh, my mother was in one car, my father and I together in another car. The Gestapo was heavily guarding everybody. And the train had stopped in the middle of that red line 
and in the middle of juggling back and forth, continued, and it was cold. We are now on the, on the foot of the Pyrenees mountain range between Spain and France. By chance, my father saw a sign someplace, and he froze, and other people froze, because Gours had been a way station, not exactly a concentration camp, but a prison camp where many of the partisans of the Spanish Civil War had gathered and were in prison. And many people who had fled from Eastern uh, Europe into through France. And so now they, there you were. Now just think about it. For those who had come from far away, mostly with no uh, many funds or anything, and wound up there and then being shipped back to the east, to either Poland, Auschwitz, or Theresienstadt, the pressure on these poor people. And then eventually the train continued to Perpignan. I had told you I would tell you about the freight cars uh, when we were ordered to go to the railroad station in Amsterdam and, and, and be transported to Westerwald. My father indicated that we were to be transported from there to Terezin, Ter Terezinstadt in Czechoslovakia. So these are the freight cars that were used and I was in them two or three times, especially that particular time I will tell you at that station that you see next to it. And they would be filled in the Netherlands and other places in Germany of people being transported to camps. They would cram in 150 or almost 200 people 600 to 700 people per train load, three to five days from the Netherlands to Poland or three, four days to Czechoslovakia. The doors were locked. So as you can see, there were no facilities, no heat, no nothing. Old uh, seniors and not seniors, kids hanging on their mother's uh, 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 clothes, crying, no food, no hygiene. So this is what you had. And naturally the towers were run or manned by the Nazis, by the German soldiers and if anybody run in or out of the trains, they would be machine gunned down. The railroad station is where we had to stay one day, one night, at midnight, waiting for the connection with the underground to take us on the train, i.e., the freight car that you see, hopefully going to Barcelona, Spain. But he was half an hour late. Now, this is in, in Perpignan, on the foothills of the Pyrenees. It was cold, freezing, no food, no this, no that. And the plan of crossing the Pyrenees took two weeks at least to plan and arrange with underground and other people. How my mother ever did that, we don't know, but she did. And my father didn't know any languages. My mother knew 11 perfectly. He only knew English badly. No, he knew English, but with a German accent and German, but nothing else. So eventually when we heard the resistance worker reading a paper, somebody was coming along 
reading a paper and whistling a certain children's rhyme song, we knew that was him. And we got eventually on a, on a car, on a train, not then knowing where this train was going to go. And it took quite a few hours after some tunnels on the Pyrenees were crossed to know that the train was en route to Barcelona and not back up north to Germany. The photograph below is, as I indicated originally, people were always dressed. Uh, we never fled in a convoy with other people walking. We walked ourselves under the stars on fields and ate and hygiened and did whatever we could as best as we could. As I indicated, there were many days that we didn't have anything to eat or drink and, and, and bread really, if you got it, and there was no flour, was made with sawdust. Now that was very good on one hand, but on the other hand, it caused digestive problems. And if you're in the middle of no place for days, etc., uh, you can figure out what the problems were. But you can see the people coming off the train in Gurs and other places, dressed with hats. Which, uh, uh, you can see a man between the two cars with a starch color, which was popular in those days, um, um, with bales and valises, etc., and always dark garments like going to work and sent to Gurs, possibly to be never seen again. Next. Uh, here are different depictions of uh, people being given some water by some helpers in a freight car. And some depictions of a woman where my mother was imprisoned in a women's camp for three months, we lost control. And the little we know, it was a psychological, mental, de depraved kind of place to be. Next. Uh, we made it to Barcelona, my father and I, we crossed the uh, Pyrenees in that train. And um, we had to be disguised as railroad workers, mushed uh, with uh, uh, shoe creams and they gave us some clothes and a bag uh, to eat, sandwiches or whatever. And I, I, I don't have the time to tell you all the story, but this is a big story. It took three months. My mother smuggled herself out thanks to English and the terrible conditions and a very heroic kind of leaving. And, 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 and she had a message for the allies, in fact, and through the chief of police, and a new bishop in Spain, Barcelona, we were uh, put on an, uh, a freighter, ironically called, and I translated the name, Cape of Good Hope, out of all names, which took two months from Barcelona to Argentina, rather than 20 days or so uh, through the Caribbean. There are many reasons why also the entire sailing was fraught with danger and, and, and persecutions, etc., etc. Next. The unsung heroes. Well, there you have two pictures of girl Aleske. I already told you who she was in later years. And uh, about 10 years ago, so my wife and I did finally um, make arrangements. I don't know if Jeff Stahl is listening to this. Through Yad Vashem in Amsterdam and through Jerusalem, we were able to have Yad Vashem recognize Gerda Leske as a righteous, righteous Gentile. 
We did meet her, meet her grandson about 10 years ago. We never met her son. And there she looked happy years after the war. And the other one is the bishop. Uh, I got this book. He lived, I got his background. And the rule of Argentina was at that time, 1942, 43, and into 45, but we were there in 1943. Argentina did not allow immigration if you didn't have original certificates of baptism. And that was the reason we had to meet the bishop because my parents had made it clear that we weren't going to change religion. And, and that was a, a meeting arranged that took three hours. Very touching, very emotional, very cordial meeting. Uh, I saw um, goblins I'd never seen until then in my life, hanging on the walls and cookies and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. He did give us the documents and without baptizing. So unsung heroes are many people. Among them, many, in spite that the Vatican, through rat lines and other machinations, Pope Pius XII, looked aside, but facilitated, and it's written in the Odessa files, if anybody has ever read the book and so on, or Uki Gonyi's book, facilitated Nazis going to Argentina, Brazil, Chile, etc., and the United States, but most of them to uh, Argentina. And So there you have it. You have an entity in the Vatican that looked aside. Pope Pius had been in Germany, New Germany, and it's still being debated what, why, and how he didn't do or did do what he did. But there were people in the Catholic Church who helped. And I have reference, not only the bishop, but people that we know who were fed and, 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 and given a, a, a living and so on, and even smuggled them out to Denmark and other areas who were in the Catholic Church. But the impression I have is that they did, they did it on their own. And naturally, to say the unsung heroes who are mostly anonymous, the resistance and underground workers in the Netherlands, in France, and in Germany in some cases, and England, who helped with her life. My mother was one of them uh, in France for a while. These people we will never know who they were, what they did. Yes, we know some in the, from the Polish ghetto and so on and so forth, but the majority we don't. There are good apples, as my wife says, in every barrel and bad apples in every barrel. And we should not whitewash everybody as being this or that. Don't be indifferent. I, I also agree with Eli Weisel that I think much of the fault of what happened was indifference. Stand up to bullying. Speak out, report it, and support it. It's a sad day in history when people not just in the United States, but I read an article today from a Holocaust organization in England, 
that apparently 30 million people out of 67 population have no clue, no clue that the Holocaust, Kristallnacht, and whatever existed. So much education is needed. And as Dr. Mir said, ask, can you also speak about examples of positive things and actions? I just did. I just did. Do I have any thoughts from the time that you still remember? Will I just spend um, over an hour talking? And if you give me time, I'll, I'll keep you here for another two weeks talking. <laughs> Uh, well, maybe it's time to a little bit invite our, our, our guests if they have a questions and if they want to speak directly to you. So please, yeah. all of you who are present here, um, if you want to say, if you want to ask a question, um, just uh, raise your hand or uh, and then you know, turn on your microphone and you can speak to, the, to Mr. Konstam directly. But um, as I was listening, it's a quite amazing story. I couldn't stop thinking about the fact that, you know, throughout all these times, um, it seems to me that you didn't lose hope and you were essentially um, also trying to, um, you, you were fighting to survive. But let's have our, our, our students, please, let's have them ask questions because I- I, I like to answer that word hope. I, I have a chance to speak with Mr. Konstam all the time, but I have Amanda, then Edwards, then Jared. So please, oh. Amanda, Edward, Jared, go ahead. Because I have an answer for hope. All right, we can, we, we, you can, you can uh, certainly Can say I that. say it? Of course, please. Oh, it's going to be very short. <laughs> One of the things, and I don't have a better word, through 5,782 years of Jewish being in history, especially during the Holocaust, under the severest situation that the Nazis couldn't take from us was hope. There was always hope. And it's a good point you made, Dr. Mirzat, that, that the children, if there are any listening, should not lose hope. Nice. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. So let's see now, Amanda, please go ahead. Ask your question. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, so I am actually have a Romani background, just to put that out there. So I'm curious, what experiences or paths have you crossed with Romani survivors or those who are also trying to escape? Have you had any encounters? What were their stories like, if you're aware? Can you repeat the question, Mirzad? Yes, uh, uh, Amanda, was. she's a Romani person herself, um, a Roma person from Europe, from, uh, and so she's asking uh, on your journey to survive, did you encounter any Romani people or any Romani individuals trying to survive as well? Because they were also prosecuted by the Nazis. The Did you come across any Romanis when you were escaping? Oh, um, that was a good question. I guess yes, but I cannot pinpoint them. Yes. He was, he was six years old at the time. And he wouldn't have known. At some points, we had all kinds of people um, joining from different areas, and I didn't have a relationship with them. Yes. So I, I, I would guess that there must have been some Romanis there, yes. Okay, so for those who didn't understand, uh, you know, Nazis went primarily after Jewish population of Europe at that time, but also they tried to exterminate Roma population, uh, or popularly known as gypsy, although they don't necessarily like to be called gypsies. They're essentially called themselves Romani. And so they were also being prosecuted by, by the Nazis and other minorities as you... Uh, well, you had the, in those days, called the homosexuals, now gay, Romanis, Jews. Um, Slavs too. Yeah. 
and, and, and anybody else, uh, people of color. Yes. And there weren't that many at that time, but there must have been. Yeah. And anybody who was no, not a, a sworn in blonde, blue eyed, white, blonde supremacist. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Uh, Edwards, Edwards is here. Please, Edwards, go ahead. Ask a question. Edwards Clements. Yeah. So when you when you guys were on the boats going through escape routes, and you and you had to hide in the um the outhouse in France, and you talk about how you had no shower, no bathe. How did you How did you have hope? How did you remain strong, hoping? How did you know that? How did you have faith that you're gonna survive and get through it? Thank you, Edward. Can you repeat? Uh, yes, Mr. Constant. Edwards says. You know, he was listening and he says through your journey to France and with all these things that you're going, no clothes, no shower, no nothing. He's wondering how did you have kept your hope? How did you kept your hope? Because obviously hope was what well, was giving you strength to survive. So what gave you that hope? Well, that <laughs> that's a very good question. It's a very deep question. I don't know that many of us have ever sat down and analyzed what gave us the hope. I think it's a combination of things. It's a combination of faith. It's a combination, if you want to think about God, okay. um, whoever your God was, to have a better um, a world, a better time. Anna Frank used to say it. And she was only, what, 13, 14 years old when she said it. She already had that vision. So how did you gather the different ingredients of a pie called hope? And, and, and many didn't. Many succumbed or many decided to, to commit suicide. We had people in my neighborhood. In, in Amsterdam, who did that, they weren't going to join. They decided, no way. So there were many like that. So it's a very, very difficult question how, 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 how to answer that. How, how do you feel when you're against the wall being forced to betray 20 yeah. people who are seniors, parents of your own and others to tell the Germans that they were they who they were hoping you would betray. And they wouldn't. And some were teenagers. So how, 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 how do you gather this? I think people, thanks God, don't know. And I hope never have to know, like your children, grandchildren, our children, grandchildren, what it takes to be under and against that wall, if it is an oven in the concentration camp or a wall and, and being shot, to have to make that decision. And some mothers gave their children in baskets or not to the convents and never saw them again. So that was their way of dealing with this. So, I think it's a very personal way of, of having to decide how you're going to handle it. And nobody knows how they're going to, to do it until they're confronted with it, which I hope you will not. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, we do have excellent students in Brow College, and I would like everybody to know that, that uh, I, I am a particularly really really happy always to interact with them jared please go ahead and then we can have person with the car 75 i don't know who that is but jared and please also people you feel free to turn on your cameras if you want so we can see you so mr konstam can see you that will be also nice if you can if you don't no problem just turn on your mic and ask question jared please yeah i would love that yes jared if you want to um um, you want to turn on your mic? Camera, go ahead. We can now hear. Hello, you. can you guys hear me? Yes. 
Okay, I just want to say thank you for um, coming out tonight and speaking to us and sharing with your experience. I appreciate it. And um, the question that I had was, if you were your parents and your parents were you, would there be anything that you would have done differently? When it comes to um, like after the years when you were able to like look over what you and your parents put together, would there be anything that you would have changed necessarily? Well, <laughs> thank top, you, top student, thank you, Jared, student. for asking the question. Um, you know, you're asking me a question almost 80 years later. The difficulty is, what are you going to decide and do at that particular moment that you're confronted to having to make these decisions that you were not prepared and had never had to make before. So I can sit here and tell you all kinds of things a posteriori, now, what could or could not. Then, at that time, I, th I thought the decisions were the correct decisions mm -hmm. because what else are you going to do? I mean, the, everything you did, a la minute, as we say in French, is you didn't know how you, if you want to hide under a railroad, on the ties, on the car, or this, or here, or do what? You didn't know. Did you do the right thing? I, my answer is, if you came out alive, and you were okay, you did the right thing. Right. Now I have a question for you. Are you Brazilian or Portuguese? Um, on my dad's side, I actually am. Ah. Yeah. Fala Portuguese? Yes. Well, for my last name, that's what I found out. Oh. Okay. Great. Great. Uh, oh, so yeah, I, I think I would also want to add that you have to understand his parents' marriage was on the rocks when they started out on this journey. They realized that they had agreed they'd get divorced if they survived. So maybe that was an impetus to keep going. They did have a child they loved dearly, both of them, and they cared for. And I think he was the glue that helped them through this tragedy, uh, this whole trip. Uh, and they did divorce once they uh, got to Argentina. Uh, Yes, and speaking of that, I posted in the chat uh, Mr. Konstantin's website, and there is a powerful letter that uh, his mother wrote. He put it on that uh, website. I was reading it, and uh, it, it's really uh, powerful. So I recommend you read it. She was recalling essentially the same experience of uh, how they tried to escape. Okay, but let's see. Now, CAR75. Thank you, Jared. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, car 75. I, I don't know who the car 75 is, but uh, <laughs> would you introduce yourself and go ahead and ask a question? Hi, that's me. I'm sorry. Um, you. <laughs> Hi, sorry. Oh, this is, I have to warn that Mr. Konstam, this student was so amazed that she will be talking to you that she was, she came to me and she said, Professor, I can't believe I'm going to be talking to somebody who actually knew Anna Frank. Well, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And what is CAR 75? <laughs> my name's Caroline Rollins. Uh, just that's my username for Zoom. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought it was yeah. a Rolls Royce or something. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, I wish that'd be cool, though. <laughs> OK, go ahead. Um, my question actually does have to pertain to Anne. Uh, what was your your favorite or most memorable memory that you've had of her? What was my Your favorite, favorite memory of Anne. Oh, God. <laughs> I think if I am going to take all the things that she said and did in our house, apartment, not house, it was her, her demeanor, her personality, her, her, uh, um, uh, I'm going to use the word gay, but not in the sense that you people think, gay of happiness. She was always happy, dancing, pranking, um, asking me to, 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 being seven years younger, to be the audience and to, to, 
to do this. And Susan has to tell, tell, tell her what you used to say if you continue to ask. Her. Well, my favorite Anne Frank saying is, Peter, if you don't stop talking, you're going to put a hole in my stomach. <laughs> so <laughs> this is how she was. She, she, and, and to answer Jared's uh, uh, question again, uh, here's this girl in the 1940s in a concentration camp thinking of a better world and, and that people are really good at heart. So how, where's this coming from? And, and so she was always that happy coming along and practicing and writing. Well, writing was a little boring, but she, she was always acting and impersonating and, and, and movies and fashion. I mean, that's what I, re I remember, this happiness, this smiley face uh, uh, of this little girl. And um, she, she, she really brought some, some uh, uh, felicity and happiness into our own apartment. Yeah, you have to know that his, uh, mm -hmm. his mother was into fashion design, uh, clothing, and that uh, she wasn't all that care caring about whether every, everything was neat and orderly. So Anna could end up in her closet trying on clothes and playing around with the clothes and leaving the papers around. And it didn't bother her mother or apparently her grandma, his grandmother either. So um, that would make it very attractive to her. His mother was extremely charming person. She ended up being uh, in Argentina, the United Nations Women's, uh, she started the United Nations Women's Organization in Argentina. She was a spectacular lady. She was unbelievable. Well, Annie would come to our apartment and my grandmother, mm -hmm. which my mother brought in the 30s, to babysit me. In those days, people could still could work. My father was working um, and my mother was a teacher. And Annie at some point would come. She knew where the fabrics was or the dresses or this. My grandmother was a fabulous baker. So she would come. Uh, my birth is on the 18th. Her was on the 12th of June. And we had a double party. I mean, she would come and munch on, 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 you know, she knew where everything was. And my grandmother would, would play with her in the sense of acting on with her and her things that she was um, um, acting out, fables or stories or, I don't know, whatever came to her head. So um, um, those were the good old days. I mean, so that's what I remember. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And we're going to be asking these people from Yad Vashem if they have some uh, internship, because some of the, my students, like her, he, they very much expressed interest, interest in essentially learning more and uh, getting involved. So excellent. Thank you for your question. Let's see who else. I have one question for Car 75. Oh, she left. What is your name? Caroline Rollins. Caroline Rollins. Rollins with L L I N S. R O L L I N S. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. Good, good for you, Carol. Thank you. Keep in touch through Dr. Mirsad or whatever. I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. That's all I can say is thank you. And I hope you buy that uh, either Rolls Royce or, <laughs> or Maserati. How about a Maserati? That, that's good too. Anyway. Okay. So we Maybe. Like my my very own daughter is listening to a night and she has Ooh. a question. She always has a question. So Nora, please go ahead and ask a question, Nora. Hello, Mr. Constan. Thank you so much for talking to us tonight. I actually do have a question, like my father says. I always have a question. Good. I see that a lot of people ask you questions about what you think you could have done differently or your, you know, perception of what was happening. And I understand that you were still quite young and you were a child, but my question um, more so involves uh, your perception of some of things as you got older. So my family also came to the United States as refugees during the Bosnian war. 
And so, you know, that didn't happen too long ago. And I was wondering, um, while this war, this genocide was going on, um, if you were watching it and did you see any similarities or any kind of dark parallels that you noticed? I mean, what was your impression of this kind of like second big genocide going on in Europe that happened this many years after the Holocaust? Um, hello, Nora, it's good meeting you. And uh, thank you for the question. I will say that uh, Dr. Mir said you have a very charming, uh, attractive young daughter here, so pretty good. Thank you, um, it's easy to talk to her, trust me, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do, Nora? I am currently um, doing my master's degree at uh, Florida International University. Oh, I'm good. studying public administration, so to good. work in the government but, eventually but you, one day. You were born in America? Yes, sir. I was born in, I was born in Florida. Yeah. Okay. There are similarities, Nora, and there are many. I think that, and I've been thinking about this more and more because there have been people from Kosovo uh, two or three years ago, four years ago, that have asked me questions I was lecturing in Germany about certain things. It doesn't matter where you're from, what color, creed, or religion you are. Because if you have to flee and you are an immigrant, or you are an immigrant, with very few um, um, things that may or may not be the same, the impact on the, on the people are the same. I used to have discussions with the boat people out of Vietnam 30 years ago. They came in on a little boat on a river and I, I, I had to cross borders and walk through. So it didn't matter. The, the, the impact on the, on the person are similar. And if you're a child, and you're coming in from the Middle East through the Mediterranean to Italy or Greece, or you're crossing the border from Mexico to Texas, for a child, the impressions are generally the same, if not similar. And how do you handle that? And the, exper the experiment, the, the, not the experiments, the, 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 what you're left with it are very similar. So my answer to, to all of this is, it doesn't matter of creed, religion, or color. It is an impact that, that puts pressures on people regardless. And how you handle it, or how you deal with it. Well, Susan just said, I have my parents, but then I was also alone for a long period of time in Argentina as a kid. But Susan is, was a mental health psychiatric social worker. So if I, I get many answers like what you answered, which are a little bit more profound, I would generally put her on to answer a question. But generally, there is not enough time to do that because some of these questions require a little bit more than that. But I don't know if I'm answering your question. You well, yes, yeah, yes, you are. Don't worry, you are answering my question. Um, the only thing I was maybe wondering was what when um uh, so the war was going on in Bosnia in the mid-90s. Um wh what did you like? I mean, I'm thinking because it also it's a European kind of issue. I know that these things happen all around the world, but I'm thinking more so as someone who was born in Europe and you have you have a more understanding of how Europe functions and then to see something similar, maybe not to the same magnitude of the Holocaust, but equally as atrocious. Um, what was your kind of like watching it? Did you have any kind of like 
how would I say bad flashbacks or bad feelings like this is happening kind of again to, you know, a different group of people, but for the same reason, you know, something I learned just from my own family history, from learning about the Holocaust and things that happen all around the world is, you know, the biggest crime anyone can commit is just being a human being. That's it. Just existing is enough of a crime for people to be subjected to all sorts of types of torture. So my question to you is um, just in reference to the genocide in Bosnia, what kind of, what, what was your perception of what was going on at the time or what, what were you thinking or, you know, about that whole situation? Uh, all right. And well, I think we also have, uh, excuse me, go ahead. We have two more questions. So let's thank you. Well, I was going to give Nora one more example. Um, I was speaking about raids in my presentation. I don't think there's any bit of difference if you're in a home in Afghanistan or in, in, in when it was Vietnam or whatever, and people come in machine gunning everybody down than what we had when they raided our homes and apartments. The scenario in the uniforms may have been different, but the facts and the results are the same. Right. Right. Okay, so we have a question uh, before we have uh, Goff uh, join us, please just turn on the mic and say and join us. And we have a Danny, we have a, a Sharif uh, uh, is asking question. Do you remember witnessing or experiencing anti-Semitism growing up before you and you were family transported? Uh, what ignorance did you face after when trying to rebuild your, your life? And that was essentially also my question. I was to ask you, you know, do you remember how that lead up into Holocaust? How that before the crystal night, how, how was that, you know, how your family was acting as it became obvious, you know, that I'm, I'm not going to say obvious, but as it, as it became evident that this is going to be happening. So it's a similar question. Well, I think there are various, um, hmm, things that happened. Don't forget for my parents, this started in 1932-33. For us in the Netherlands, by then I was there, it's 19, uh, late 1930s and into the 40s. And it was a gradual situation of the best example I can give you, Mirsad, is, is to strangle the bottle. And it was one regulation and rule after another. The big things that happened that established the history, which is, I think, what you were underlining here, of how did the Holocaust and all of this start? Well, it started at the, well, it started, first of all, it started in Versailles, the meeting of Versailles. Then you had Vance. I don't know if you ever read about the Vance meeting outside of Berlin. And then that gradually these individuals that were part of that, Eichmann was part of that, Haider was part of that, talking about Czechoslovakia, where is, where is Nora? Uh, he was eventually killed there at some point. Um, these were intelligent people. They were not that they were uneducated. What happened is that they gathered and magnetized others who joined in and it became a rowdy crowd of criminals, they just decided to, to, to go along. So, and then actually Kristallnacht, I forgot to mention. So these are some of the, the, the things that happened and, and people started to know and figure out. I remember people were talking in our apartment all along that things were going to happen, how they were going to happen, et cetera, and then they did. Uh, all right, uh, uh, Goff, is he still here? Yes or no? Or he left us? Yes, please, you, you wanted to join us. And then we have a Danny also afterwards. Danny, 
I see your hand. Give us a chance, please. Yes, go. How are you? I'm good. I'm still here. And Peter, I, uh, I always enjoy hearing you, and I appreciate everything you shared with us tonight. I was curious um, more about the, the, the afterwards and how you use the experience you went through um, and all the adversity to your advantage, because I know you became very successful in business and you made quite the life for yourself. Um, so you obviously have drawn on some of that adversity um, and, and found a way to use it in, in becoming a successful businessman. So I thought maybe you could share uh, some of some of your insight on how you made that happen. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> how did I make that happen? Good luck. <laughs> uh, no luck is. I, I have a few quick answers. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll pick another night for more time. <laughs> oh, okay, but I'll give you a quick one because the people that here deserve an answer. Actually, I think the, the question was how do I get through it and make it to here now? Is that correct? More or less. Okay. In fact, I was just talking with Susan this morning. We were watching. I think it's very subjective, but you need. I I'll, I'll talk about me. I had a focus. I had a goal, and I did the best I could in working through these goals to then choose and guide my way. But being because you are a high officer of Yad Vashem, I'll, I'll, I'll put in a few things. When my grandmother left, uh, died before, just the day before, in the hospital, she was just about 80. She put a hand on my hand and in German said, let it be a Jew. That was it. Last words. It never made big, it, it never resonated with me very much. And that was in 1980. By 1964, when I met this young girl here, which was fan, is fantastic, and it, I mean, I wouldn't be here without her, really, who is still uh, training me or therapeuting me, if you want to put it that way. I did. How? Because by somebody who I never know if he was Jewish or not, I was working with a, a goy in New York City to keep my feet wet for, for four months. Um, I asked him one day, I was 28 now, where do I meet a Jewish girl or, or whatever? I had never been very religious, by the way. He said, go to Temple Emmanuel. So I said, what the hell is that? So I said, well, go up Fifth Avenue and, and you'll see a big synagogue, that's it. So I, I, I did. January of 1964. And when I joined, if you know, be shared, two things happen. I not only met her when I had to work to gain her heart or, or her mind. Her heart, I don't know, but her mind, yes, wasn't easy. And I didn't know that in the synagogue were distant relatives, corn stamps, but with two M's spelled. And they, many years later, I found out they contacted a company. Blah, blah, blah. I got a call. Well, long story short, I got a job when I stayed for 35 years with H. Constam Chemicals. And I got a girl. <laughs> Why? A synagogue. Be shared. So, but it's, it's I, I have three grandchildren, three grandsons. What kind of wisdom do I leave them today when what I'm talking about is 80 years ago when I was a kid? Many things have changed, but many things have not. 
the values have not changed. Tenacity, goals to be motivated and to educate, etc., and all these other noble things that we call, keep talking about. So Excellent. Excellent. that is how I, 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 I moved forward. Now, during the war, Susan indicated, and it's a good point, it never occurred to me, I was with parents. I was always with people, with family. So I, I, I would tell my kids that I'm allowed to be screwed up, but you don't have an excuse to be screwed up. So it's that kind of thing. Excellent. So this is essentially Goff, um, you know, behind every man, there is a woman, right? Like how they say. So here we have heard that one more time. Very good. So let's see, Danny, uh, please join us and ask your question, comment. And then after that, we can finish our discussion. We broke the time, essentially 45 minutes. So thank you all for patience. Danny, please join us. Go ahead. Good night. So my question is, I know like when this whole situation is happening, you're obviously very young and it could be a very scary time. And a lot of things probably were running through your mind. And so I just want to know, like, what's one thing you probably would tell your younger self now um, that you've grown up and you can look back on the situation? Like, what's one thing that your now self will tell your younger self, like getting through um, the circumstances that you had to face? Thank you. What would you tell that five-year-old uh, Peter now uh, in order to survive all this? That's a good question. You see, I told you we have excellent students in Broward College. Yeah. What would I tell me 80, 80 years ago? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think I can only think what my grandmother would tell me. And, um, I mean, I admit we didn't have many philosophical discussions in those days, but during the good times, my grandmother would tell me stories uh, for kids, for kid, children's stories about the Bible and this and that. I, I would tell little Peter to um, to follow his parents and to to not lie and be careful who he would join on the streets and um, uh, ask his parents, ask my parents before I did, who I was going to be um, um, playing with. Now, um, Many friends came naturally through the parents, who knew parents, but quite a few did not. So you cannot give, I wouldn't give little Peter a philosophical discussion because that would not be, but maybe give examples of, of, uh, uh, the Bible for children. You know, my, my grandmother had, a, had a, a book. She she would read to me stories of the Bible, but with drawings for children, you know, which was, I still remember it. And, and I would give examples to just be right and do the right thing. And that's about the only thing I could do at this moment to tell him. I don't know what else I could tell him if it is not confronted, that he was confronted with a certain issue or problem, you know, to do the right thing, be honest, be courteous, and that's about it. I, I don't know if I have any other wiser answer than that. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. So everyone, Thank you for being with us. We're going to have a Kashmala now. Again, uh, do the closing. Um, 
Thank you for Muslim Student Association and Social Science Club, as well as Social and Behavior Sciences uh, and Human Services Pathway for supporting us. And uh, we hope to see you again. Uh, Mr. Konstam, uh, when the corona um, pandemic ends, we really <laughs> hope that you may essentially come one time on this east coast of Florida and visit us at Brown College. But let's hear Kashmala, please, Kashmala, go ahead. All right, guys, to wrap up this knowledgeable event, we learned and remembered about the innocent victims in the tragic event of the Holocaust, especially from a live point of view from our guest speaker, Mr. Konstam. Thank you again so much. Yes, thank you very much. We really appreciate you taking your time out of your day for us. Yeah, so thank you a lot for giving your time to us and the community. We appreciate it greatly, along with our wonderful advisor, Dr. Mirsad Kriyesh Thank you so much again.